So the deal is this that uh, while there is, I don't, we can we can go soon like after. After. Yeah, yeah. I think just send that. I feel like I don't want to wait. Do we have an overflow? There's no way it's going to be fire code violation. If you are. But there is, there is, uh, you can give them a URL. Sorry, I should be on loop. Hold on, I gotta make sure that you're going to do it. And so, by the way, it's fish fry. You're too popular. Thank you. It's fish fry. Yeah, it's fish fry. Yeah, it's fish fry. We should have an overflow. Oh, my God. I don't know. It's just a few minutes. Uh, Fishbowl is, is right here. Yeah. So. And Juan Carlos, just send the live stream link. <laughs> okay, you can, right. you can get with started, that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, 
The rest of you, please quietly get food while uh, Anima starts this. Sure. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ken Goldberg. He is an artist, inventor, and professor at Berkeley. He is currently the chair of operations research. He's also a professor in EECS, School of Information, Art Practice, and Ra Radiation Oncology, uh, among many things. Uh, and among all of those things, he's also my advisor, friend, and mentor. And uh, Okay, former advisor. Former advisor, always advisor. That's true. <laughs> Academic parent. Uh, and uh, and uh, he's really an expert in grasping, and he spent many decades thinking about uh, manipulation, grasping, starting out from geometric algorithms back in the mid-'80s, and now new machine learning algorithms, which kind of clearly captures what today's discussion is. And uh, we are very excited about new problems in how we should be thinking about robot manipulation, how phys physical objects and physical robots interact with these things, and how problems in machine learning can be combined with uh, geometric and analytic algorithms uh, in these problems. So without further ado, I would give the stage to Ken to hear about all of the exciting new work. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much, you. Ken. Thank you, Ganamesh. I appreciate it. It's so great to see so many of my friends here, uh, Ken and Mark and Leo. Um, and and, and Fei Fei, I, I, uh, it's really a pleasure, and I, I, I appreciate the, the great turnout on a, on a Friday afternoon for the talk. So I have um, I put together um, 180 slides, so I'm going to go really fast. Um, let me start by saying uh, this is I, everything I'm talking about is really the product of a fantastic group of students. Animesh being one of them. We have uh, a number of collaborators, really interested in possible collaborations with, with you here at Stanford. I also want to do a quick um, shout out to Bear, which is their new Berkeley AI Research Lab. And uh, that's sort of in the same spirit as the, uh, the AI Lab here at, uh, at Stanford. One of the things that I want to talk about, is I'll try and cover all these topics as, as best I can in the time we have and leave a little time for questions as well. I don't think I have to convey to you that the problem in, is in grasping and manipulation is difficult. This is what the, the visualization which shows you this is how ro the world robots live in. So uh, the world, ev your sensors are poor, you're, they're, they're unreliable, there's a lot of noise. Your actuation is poor and unreliable. And uh, as a result, your, your robots are incredibly clumsy and they remain so. Uh, the, the issue is uncertainty. We have uncertainty in, the, in perception, in control, and also in physics. That's a that's a, a fundamental core, and we there are models of dealing with uncertainty that have been around for many centuries, namely probability. But the the challenge is that the distributions often look like this: they're 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 multimodal, non-parametric distributions. They're not nice, well-behaved Gaussians. Um, so we can there's things we can do. We can do numerical methods. We can do Monte Carlo sampling and particle filters. Those are those are actually the right way to go, but the, they don't scale well. So as you go to higher and higher dimensions, the, they become increasingly intractable. The good news is that we now have access to in unprecedented levels of computing. And computers are, we have cluster of computing, we can start to do things that we couldn't even consider doing when I was a grad student, when Mark and I were grad students. And uh, so, so there's, a, there's a big advantage to that kind of cloud computing, if you will. And the second is that uh, no matter what we do, we're always going to encounter cloud corner cases. So there's going to be situations where a robot is trained to be able to do something, pick up around your home, but it's going to come up with something weird that it's never seen before like this, and it doesn't know what to do with it. So the other nice thing is now with the cloud, we have access to remote data sets. So almost everything that you encounter, mm -hmm. there's somewhere out there on the web, there's going to be a three-dimensional model with nice um, information about its centers of mass, its, uh, its, its, uh, its geometry and frictional properties, and also where it needs to go, its semantics. So this is what, what we're calling, and actually James Kuffner came up with this term first, cloud robotics. And I really like the idea that, that we really can change the fundamental assumption in robotics, which was that all robots have to be self-contained, that they have to keep all of their sensing and processing on board and their memory on board. Now they're sharing information uh, with remote data centers where they have processing and memory uh, at, at centralized places. The other nice thing is, though, that this opens the door to robot learning. And that's where robots are sharing data, and now they can start to bring that, the, that, that vast amount of data together to, uh, to, to infer policies and to generalize across environments. So I want to focus the rest of the talk on specifically on the, the problem, as Animesh mentioned, that I've been interested in for many years, uh, grasping. And the, the, this, is, this particular problem is something that we all do effortlessly. 
Uh, it, it, it always surprises, uh, you know, members of the public if they come to my lab, they're like, God, you know, robots really can't do that yet? And uh, unfortunately, they can't. Uh, sometimes this is known as Mar Moravec's paradox, because Hans was the one to say, isn't it interesting that um, things that are incredibly hard for humans, like precision spot welding, are extremely easy for robots, but conversely, things that are really easy for humans, like picking up the, all the clearing these tables, um, are very hard for robots. And that paradox was, he, he posed this and uh, pointed this out in about 30 years ago, but amazingly, we really haven't made much progress since then. So, and it's important because we have scenarios like this increasingly, where we want to do order fulfillment in very vast data set er, um, uh, warehouses where the object set is, 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 vo is, is voluminous, right? There's constantly changing, many, many different objects we need to handle. And to be able to do this kind of thing, which is uh, increasingly important, uh, we have, this is really beyond the capabilities of robots. We, we, they're very good at picking up, placing one particular thing over and over again. But as soon as you give them a very diverse set of objects, constantly changing, we don't know how to solve that problem. And similarly, um, this problem would be nice to solve. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this looks like any of your rooms, but uh, it is, you know, this is, uh, this is a universal problem. Everybody uh, with kids would like to solve this, uh, teenagers. And also for senior citizens, it's very important uh, that senior citizens want to keep the, the environment clear because they, if to fall is a very uh, huge proposition. I like this, uh, Rod Brooks just put this out in uh, a, a couple months ago, February, that the grand challenge was, um, from his perspective, he's working a lot with industry around the world, and he said the, the issue is to grasp millions of different sized and shaped objects. Um, if we could do that, we'd have significant impact on robots in factories, fulfillment centers, and homes. All right, and I also want to make a quick note that I'm a big believer in, um, in the Parallel Jog Ripper. And this comes from my, partly my experience with Matt Mason at Carnegie Mellon, who, who drove this point home, and I, I, I still uh, subscribe to it, which is that you can do amazing things with, with, with two jaws. Um, this is just an example. This is the, um, the Da Vinci. We can thank Ken for this. Uh, it's a beautiful mechanism. And, it, and, and when it's driven with the proper, with, with human perception and human control, you can do almost anything. And this is just one example, but you can, you can do suturing in, among, in a moving, uh, complex environment, which I'll touch on later. So you don't need very complex hands. Um, all right, so now I want to talk about the, the three waves. So the first wave I want to say of, of grasping is, um, really goes back to, the, to, our, to our, 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 our forefathers. Uh, most of them were men. Um, Fei Fei, but uh, they were uh, they were working in the area of mechanics, and these were the old mechanicians, Me mechan mechanicians or mechanicians. mechanicians. Thank you. Okay, um, and they they did beautiful work at analyzing complex systems of gears and motors and levers, um, usually under this um, uh, the, the, the there was a, this beautiful research, and it was uh, it's very elegant. Um, this is uh, one of the texts that's, that's fundamental to it. Um, with uh, Murray, Zhe-Sheng Li, and Shankar Sastri, I had the good fortune of, to uh, co-teach a class with Shankar and also with Rujana last year. And it, was, it gave me some opportunity to really go back and look at a lot of this, uh, this literature and this, um, this, this theory of, uh, of, of the analytic methods for, for grasping. <coughs> and it's very beautiful. And um, it's based on physics. So you can understand uh, form closure, uh, force closure, there's ideas about mobility and about um, stability, uh, but um, the, uh, the idea here is that you want to be able to define uh, the state of a system and then plan a grasp, find a, a grasp, computer grasp, that will optimize the success mes method um, and uh, whether the object will be s stable in some uh, rigorous, uh, rigorously defined way. Um, now if you look at the literature, you can sort of pull out some, make a, a, a word cloud and you see things like this and then oftentimes the examples look like this. Now the thing is that these examples are, this is actually known, also known as the platonic solids. Now the reason I put that out, point that out is that I, I like this picture of Plato. So here's Plato with his uh, associates and he's pointing up. You see his finger there? It's pointing up. Why? Because he's saying to understand the world you really need to look up at the idealized forms that are out there, the platonic solids. These are perfection and that's really where knowledge is going to come from. We start with the right axioms when we can deduce how to work with the world. Now, this is actually how roboticists have been thinking for a long time. In fact, even today, so this is the new edition of the Handbook of Robotics, and I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about this big now. 
And um, <laughs> it has a chapter on grass paper, thir chapter 38. And it's quite a wonderful chapter. It's about um, 40 pages long or so with a lot of detail of all the, the fields of grasping. But um, what's interesting is it's not until page 39 um, <laughs> that uh, this sentence is sort of buried in there. It's sort of, oh, by the way, when a robot identifies an object to grasp, its knowledge of the object's pose and geometry are not perfect. This might be one of the grandest uh, understatements uh, in the world. Uh, so, you know, and, and this is, but this is, well, I point this out because this is the state of the art. We, we generally make a lot of assumptions that we know the shape of the environment, we know the, 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 the manipulator, we know the contact points perfectly. And the reality is more like this. So the world is not so nice, and even with the state of the art three dimensional um, RGBD uh, point cloud sensors, this is really what you get. And, um, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of holes, so, so anything that has a, um, um, uh, specularities or transparencies, they just become uh, artifacts. And so the 3D point cloud doesn't solve your problem either. So you just have a huge amount of uncertainty. You don't know all the things that you need to do these analytic platonic models. All right, so the second wave is to um, start to bring in empirical methods. And this is, is, is to learn from the physical observations. In other words, don't, don't try to, to go from an idealized world, but start from the real world. And that, the hope is that if you do that, you'll become robust to noise. And there's a number of researchers have been looking in that direction. And um, I like this one, uh, Stephanie Tellex at Brown. She, her idea is to take this you know, to an extreme and have the robot essentially learn to manipulate over a long period of time. You can watch it in the window in the back. It's going overnight. And she wants to do a million object challenge, so she wants people, whoever has robots, to basically do this and share information. It's really cloud robotics at its es essence um, over, over time. And so uh, you can see that this works, uh, interestingly, but it takes a long time. Now I would claim this is, or, or I want to argue, this is really Aristotle's approach. And Aristotle, if you notice, um, is, is putting his hand down. So Aristotle, by the way, wasn't the first student to disagree with his advisor. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, Plato, he disagreed with Plato. He said, hey, you know, um, uh, actually you're wrong. You're looking, the wrong you're looking in the wrong place. I know everything is nice and idealized there, and the light might be better, but actually the real action is down here in the physical, dirty physical world. And what you should be doing is looking at lots of examples of data and then trying to infer principles and methods from that. And, uh, and this really has been, is, is I would say, the second wave. This is very popular right now. And it's really also been very much affected by the results in deep learning, which I don't need to, um, to, to, to elaborate on here. But, um, but, but this has enabled lots of new results. And especially when this comes to, uh, to, to be applied to, to reinforcement learning. So uh, Peter Abiel and, uh, and, and, and Sergey Levine and many others are starting to now look at, can we start to learn not just um, simple uh, mappings, but can we start to learn policies, control policies, sequential policies from, um, from observations? And can we do self-learning from these? The, um, and you're familiar with this result from the ARM farm that Sergey's, uh, that, that Sergey reported recently and is still active down at Google. Um, now, one thing I want to point out is that these methods are really exciting, um, but they do have a challenge in sample complexity. So what happens is they, they, they actually need quite a bit of data. And um, the group at CMU, you know, at 700 robot hours, uh, Sergey's about a factor of 10 uh, larger than that, and I think probably hasn't been reported yet, but I'm guessing another factor of 10 since then. Um, but what you have to notice is how the success rate uh, sort of seems to grow, but it's kind of asymptotes. So you get up to about 80, some 90, 85, 90%, but it's hard, then it starts slowing down. And so you need a lot more data to be able to get past that. <coughs> All right, so I want to talk about um, Dexterity Network. And this is, a, this is really the work of my graduate student, uh, Jeff Mahler, who's going to finish in about a year. And I'll start with DexNet 1.0, which is a, the first wave of, the, of what we've been doing. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, ImageNet. Um, very, very exciting uh, uh, results have come out of it. And, uh, and so we've been looking at that and thinking, could we do something analogous in uh, the realm of grasping. So can we build a, an image net, or a grass net, or a dexterity network for uh, three-dimensional objects that would 
do something similar. Can we see scaling effects if we get enough <laughs> objects into the into the set? Can we start learning from 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 analysis across objects and then specifically about how to grasp them? So what we do is we start with the analytic method. So we go back to Plato and we ask um, if we can. Um, we set for each of these objects that we've we've uh, we, we've captured in our in our data set. We'll have a center of mass, coordinate frames. We'll start considering different grasps. And for each grasp, it's a pair of contact points, because remember, we're talking about a parallel jaw gripper now, and <coughs> a couple normals, and then we have moment arms. And so we want to basically apply the formal methods. But um, what we're going to do is, is think of this in a probabilistic setting. So you can have a graphical model. So I have conditional distributions now. So um, for all these parameters are, are stochastic. So um, the pose is not necessarily known, and the um, the object pose and the grasp pose and, and the shape all give you give rise to variations in the contact normals. And then the, um, the center of mass may not be known, so the, 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 the mass properties also gives variation, gives rise to variation in the torques and the forces coming from the friction um, and the normals, and all this comes down to how, what is the, the quality of the grasp. And by quality, I really mean the, the robustness. Will the grasp succeed? Uh, over a number of trials. And uh, what we want to do now is, um, is is a slightly different version of the problem I showed you earlier, where now success is, is evaluated over a set of perturbations. And so what I want to do is, uh, given different variations in the object and the, um, <coughs> and the grasp, and now I want to compute the success, and I want to take the expectation, and that's going to be my quality measure. So it's expected success of the grasp. And then I want to find a grasp that maximizes that expected performance. So that's my policy for that object. So what, what's key there is the, is the um, perturbations. So I want to sample lots of different variations. So if I have a particular grasp, I'm going to actually perturb it a little bit and perturb the object, perturb the co coefficient of friction, et cetera. And for each of those, accumulate a weighted probability that those, um, each of those perturbations is going to succeed. So you can see this is an example just of how you might do this for one, um, one part. Now, the, the, just to go over what the, the, this computation is, is that um, the robustness or the quality, um, I have for each of the objects that I have in the data set about 1,000 facets, right? So they're, they're, they're mesh models. And so uh, a, a particular grasp is a pair of facets, just a pair of contacts. And so that gives a rise to about a million candidate grasps. And then for each of those grasps, I want to consider about 1,000 perturbations. So I'm going to perturb the, the conditions ever uh, slightly. So that's about a billion grasp evaluations. And, um, and then I have about 14,000 currently objects in my, in my data set. So that's giving me about 14, tera, um, 14 trillion um, grasp evaluations. Now fortunately, these are relatively fast uh, because these are analytic evaluations. But that's still a fairly large amount of data, uh, of, of processing that has to occur. So when we looked at that, we started thinking, well, maybe we can make use of uh, multi-arm bandits. Rather, rather than sampling uh, in a brute force way, we could sample more intelligently. And um, sure enough, we found that this works. So the, the, the key inside of, of multi-arm bandits is starting to um, spend more time on grasps that are promising. So as you're sampling, don't spend a lot of time with the grasps that are really failing a lot, because they're just not, not going to be that, that, that likely. But don't spend all your time on the most promising grasps. The idea is to, have to balance, to do some exploration uh, and some exploitation. And so using the, the, the standard sampling methods of uh, Giddens sampling and Thompson sampling for multi-arm bandits, we actually got uh, very, very dramatic improvements in the, um, in, the, in the quality of the grasp as a function of the number of iterations. So this was a result about a year ago. Then we started thinking, um, can we also get a benefit from um, the idea of locality? In other words, if I have two similar objects like this, um, if I've already pre-computed good grasps for this object, can that give me a, a, a nice prior for the new object? <laughs> and similarly, if I have a grasp that's here on one object, um, that should give me a nice prior for a similar grasp. Just a small perturbation in the grasp. That should, I should be able to not have to re start from scratch. Now, the key thing, um, the, the, the key challenge here is how do, you, how do you compute similarity very, very quick, efficiently? And Leo's working on this. There's a number of techniques in the... Uh, in the graphics literature for being able to do this. We, we actually um, tried a number of techniques and had um, and, and found this one, which is uh, multi-view convolutional neural networks. So this is the deep learning technique 
that basically trains um, views, synthetic views of a three-dimensional object, and then uses those to train a network so that all those views are, are, are lined with one particular object shape. And then what you can do is you give it a new object, and it will light up the um, objects that have a similar shape. And that actually works surprisingly well. We were, we were, we were actually, I, I was a bit skeptical, I have to say, and then a student coded this up over the summer, and it was very, uh, very dramatically um, exciting results. So we use that, and so we use it is to essentially inform a kernel, um, a kernel measure of the similarity of two objects. And um, we also build in the similarity of the grasp as well. And we use this in a multi bandit model where we're training um, a beta process. So we have two parameters, alpha and beta. And so when we see a success, we basically weight that by the similarity of the, um, of the, of the similarity of the object shape and of the grasp. So that allows us to converge faster than it would if you just started from scratch. And then what we do is we build up this network so that of the 14,000 objects in the dexterity network, the objects are, have, are, are linked in terms of how similar they are. And so once we, have, we, we identify a grasp that's successful on one object, it can propagate to other objects. And then we do evaluations there. And, um, and when a new object comes in, we can find similar objects and use those to, to, to uh, converge uh, on, a, on a robust grasp. So we implemented this. The nice thing is this is very nicely parallelizable, so we can implement it on a number of servers with, uh, and this is joint work with Google. And um, so we had about 1,500 nodes. And so we, we partition out the data set, the dexterity network, into uh, subsets where they can each be, be performed in parallel, uh, analyzed in parallel. And so we, we also were interested in the scaling effect, basically you know, the, the, the same question of ImageNet, right? If you get big enough, you start to see things and performance dramatically improves. So here's a plot that shows this. Um, this is a, a new object. This, this is a, something we, we don't have anything similar to this in the data set. So for even for 1,000 objects, or we get up to 10,000, there's nothing quite like it. So we get performance, but it's only marginally improved. But when we get an object like this, um, at 1,000 objects, we see uh, there's some objects that are similar. I don't know about that shoe, but you can sort of <laughs> see how it's sort of similar to that. But when, uh, but when you get up to 10,000 objects, well, all of a sudden, you start seeing a lot of spray bottles come up. So the nice thing is that shows you right here that you get very fast computation because you found objects that, um, that allow you to bootstrap that beta process and allow the, uh, the, the, the grasp to, to converge very quickly. Okay, so that, that's DexNet 1.0. And um, we have, um, I want to just give you a quick aside that we also have been very interested in a, in, a, in a fun little problem about privacy, which is that companies may, the idea is of, data, of DexNet is that you, you would take an object and you would go up into the cloud, and it would come down and tell you the grasps for the object. And part of the problem is people may not want to share the full model of their objects, because companies are very paranoid about giving you their CAD models. <laughs> so we, we, we were working with Siemens, and we basically came up with this idea that you could mask the object, because you really don't need to share all the object. You just need to get a part of the surface. There's no need to, to give it the full surface. And then you can look for grasps on that part surface subset, and then send back grasps. And if you weren't happy, you could send, give it a little more of the um, object's uh, boundary. So um, <coughs> there's a lot more to do there. And there's some interesting uh, issues about how do you selectively reveal an object to get good grasps. <coughs> now, I also want to mention this. I really like these results that are coming out now in uh, adversarial um, deep learning, adversarial images for deep learning. Everyone's familiar with this, where you have all these objects. Um, and they're nicely classified by a deep learning system. And then with a small perturbation, um, <laughs> <laughs> you get this. Uh, so um, you know, it's troubling. It's troubling. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a little Achilles heel. It's a chink in the armor of, uh, the, of all the optimism, because we're starting to see, hey, you can, const you can construct counterexamples where uh, things don't turn out as nicely as you, as you expected. And Animesh has got some new work, which I'm really excited to see, and how this can be done for policies. Um, we've been looking at it in terms of grasping, too, because a lot of times in grasping work, um, people do a result, then they show you the robot grasping the object and, you know, it's success. But <laughs> they all, the ob it's not that hard to grasp a cylinder, okay? <laughs> or most prismatic objects are pretty, pretty straightforward. If it's got parallel edges, it's not, not an issue. But when you get weird objects like this, again, with a parallel jaw gripper, with noise and all those other factors, it becomes hard. And so we've been interested in how can we think about adversarial objects, objects that are going to really give um, a grasping algorithm a challenge. So we, we downloaded a bunch of these objects by basically inspection. Um, and then we've 3D printed them. And then we've been using them to in, in, in experiments in the lab. Um, so we set up this thing here. 
Um, it's a, uh, you, can see it, you can't see it very well, but there's a wire that sort of resets the object. So it will basically allow it to put it back down. And then there's a rotating base there, too, that can allow you to give some variation. And then um, we're basically trying out grasps that Dexnet had predicted um, and see how well they actually perform in practice. And um, here's the thing. We, we, um, so we had these objects. We went random, and then we would run, let's say, thousands of experiments. We also did this with, a, uh, with, the, uh, with the ABB Yumi robot in our lab. Um, and we got these results that uh, were not as good as we thought. We, in other words, um, part of the issues in, uh, is that the, we had perception problem, that, the, uh, that we're getting translation errors. If we're trying to perceive where the object is, um, we have about uh, five millimeters of error in the translation and about four degrees in the rotation. And uh, it, takes a quite, it takes some time to compute that uh, transformation. And so we, got, we, we were not getting the kind of results we were, we were hoping for. Um, so we got a, about 83% accuracy. Okay, this is after using all the machinery I just described to come up with what we thought were robust grasps, but still there's, they're not as robust as you think because of artifacts that largely were coming out of the perception system. So the new wave. Okay, so um, Jeff started thinking maybe, maybe we should really uh, start, start thinking about integrating the deep learning more into the, into the perception system. So this is what DexNet 1.0 is like. Okay, you have raw input images. You do a color segmentation. Then you do a classification of what object it is. Then you do a three. You, you pull out the three D model, three three dimensional model, and then you align it to the object surface and use that to execute the planned grasp. His idea is let's cut out two of these steps. Let's go directly from the raw input image, and then we'll try and do a classification of that to to go directly to a grasp. So what do I mean? Well. We're going to go from point clouds to grasps. And, um, but the, the insight is, his insight really, is to, um, to use DexNet 1.0 to generate a huge training set. And the idea is that if you, you you're going to synthetically, you're going to synthesize 3D point cloud images from this uh, big data set of, of objects, and then use that, because we also know what ground truth is, because we've computed what are stable um, or robust grasps. And we use that to train a network that will go from the image to the grasp. And, uh, or actually, it goes from image to an estimate of the grasp robustness. So then once we have that, then we look at an image and we find basically areas of high robustness, predicting high robustness, and then we execute there. Um, OK, so the idea here is to, uh, is to use this physics that I mentioned earlier, this platonic idea, to, to estimate the, the, the conditional distributions, the DexNet 1.0. But now to take that into something that actually tries to use deep learning to find grasps that maximize those, that, that quality metric. So we render, um, we use a, a, a standard technique. So we have a three-dimensional model, the mesh, and we render it with noise. So we get these point clouds uh, that are depth images. And then we know the stable pose. And we have this, um, basically, uh, we can then generate grasps, because we know what the grasps we want to consider are. Um, so these are, oops, sorry, back. These are the grasps that we're looking for. So then we basically align all the grasps in a grasp-centric grasp coordinate frame. And then we use that to train how robust each of these grasps are. And then um, we can do this for many, many grasps using the, the data set. Um, and we also train it on positive and negative examples. So since we know um, the robustness of the, of the true positive examples, we also want to show it lots of of, of examples that are not robust. And we also do data set augmentation, so we can, we can actually rotate the parts and reflect them, et cetera, so we get um, a lot of variation in the, um, in, the, in the image space. And so we generated so far six million examples uh, from this a subset of the 3D objects. Then we generated about 100 grasps per object. We get the many images, um, three-dimensional point cloud images. We use a mix of positive and negative examples of this. We train up a neural net, so basically the output should be uh, this, the robustness. Okay, so we just do that, and then um, the idea of DexNet 2.0 here, this is this new wave, which because it's combining these two things, is that it's taking the analytic models as an input to training this network, and then in, um, in, in when execution time, the system is looking down, generating, taking that point cloud image, running it right through here, coming up with the grasp to execute. So um, this is what it looks like. Uh, that's the block diagram, but let me show you um, some experiments. 
And so we also ran these as double-blind physical trials. So what we did was we, we didn't know what algorithm the robot is using. So we just have it run different algorithms, and the human our grad students are putting in objects, and they also, um, <laughs> so far they are, um, they're, uh, they, they're putting them in a box and then just sort of shaking and putting it down. So they're not trying to bias where the placement of the object is well. And then um, we, we, we collect data on this. And um, by the way, we also, these are the adversarial objects I mentioned earlier. And the, the, tr the, the, the test set is, uh, is different objects. So we also, uh, you know, as uh, you want to do is have a training set that's, um, that's different. The physical training set is different than the, than the test set. So we went out and found other objects that were uh, also, we thought, hard but hadn't been seen by the system or hadn't been trained. And so here's what we got. We got that um, the success rate, when we only had 10 objects in the, uh, uh, in the training set, we get about 83, about 100 objects to get up to 85, but if we get up to 1,000, you start getting an interesting improvement. So we get up to 93%. Uh, percent. Again, this is with just with the training set. So we've already experienced these objects, so it's not that surprising. Um, then um, we also, um, what was this? Um, oh, this is comparing the, uh, the, the GQ neural network, which is what grasp quality um, convolutional neural network. Um, but here's the most interesting thing is that for um, when we just consider precision, that is when the system feels it's competent in its grasp, um, it, almost, it always succeeds. I mean, this, this is actually it's like 99% because we did have a failure, but it was surprisingly effective. Um, this is the surprise to me. I asked him to go back and do a lot more experiments, and he came back, and it's 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 really promising that um, this seem, this method seems to be the right mix of these two waves of approach. Um, there are still some failure modes, so there's things that can happen that, that cause it to fail, um, but it is uh, it's it's really working uh, surprisingly well. Um, we have a bunch of ideas now about how to fine tune it. Um, to basically looking at hard negatives and hard positives um, to, to find grasps that are failing and then keep training on those to refit the, um, the, the, the model, the neural network, to those cases. And then hopefully it's going to get better over time. Now again, I'm very conscious of this asymptote that I mentioned earlier. So I'm not claiming that we're actually going to reach 100%. But I'm saying that we're seeing promise that I didn't anticipate. Yeah, we're wondering, how would you uh, account for um, object properties such as softness uh, oh. Sleeper or not. Um, so is it something that you're also, how you must be injecting this information in your... It's a great question. So w how do we account for, for, for like uh, deformation in objects and, and slipperness? We don't. Everything we've assumed is perfectly uh, uh, rigid objects. Um, and, uh, and but here's the interesting thing. When we ran this over some other objects, this is another set. So Jeff's getting very good at going around and collecting stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, he threw this in. Now, here's the example. This is not, so these are things totally not trained on, okay? Like that shoe, uh, this piece of fabric. These are not things, we were training on rigid objects. So we don't know why this is, why this is working here, okay? I, and it's not, <laughs> not anything smart. Um, uh, you know, again, and this is in clutter, right? So again, it was trained in isolation for each object. So we, we're, we're a little bit surprised. Uh, it seems because it's there's some aspect of locality. So it knows the locality of a three-dimensional little area of point cloud and it's using that so that seems to be how it's getting able to, it's able to work in clutter so it's looking for those little cloud um, those areas um, but yeah I think being able to account for deformation in in the in the part that actually you would add another variable into that stochastic model which is um, you, you actually change the shape but we didn't do that so far um, okay, so just in, su in, in summary then of where we've come so far, it's like w what I, what I want to point out is this idea that the first wave was Plato. You can't put him down. It's got a, it's a lot going for, for, for nice model-based methods, and I'm still a fan of those, and I, don't, I hope we never, those never go away because they're really beautiful and elegant, and we can prove theorems about them, and we can differentiate them, and we can, uh, we, we, you know, they're, 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 they're fundamental things, so let's not lose those. But let's also appreciate Aristotle's input that it is also important to observe the world and observe real patterns and, and, and behavior in, in the reality and, um, and then put them together. Now how, find ways that they, we can hybridize these and how can we um, actually, this new wave I think is going to be increasingly, how do we start putting these two kinds of approaches, two ways of thinking, these two philosophies 
together into one. All right, so I have a little time left. I want to zip through um, some other new ideas that I'm excited about, just to give you a flavor of what we're doing in the lab. Um, the first one is, uh, is these are both have to do with imitation learning and, and reinforcement learning, uh, where, again, in a deep, uh, deep network context, so Michael Lasky is another uh, PhD student, and he's been looking at a number of problems like these, where we want to basically learn from examples, so human demonstrations. And the um, the challenge is that um, that that if you just observe demonstrations and you do um, supervised learning, uh, you, you 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 often don't. Um, it, it's very difficult to converge. So one idea, Dagger has come along. It's called on policy learning. Uh, and basically what it says is what we should do is actually let the robot execute what it thinks is the best policy and then have a human go in and correct the policy, that form of demonstration, not just watch the human all the time. It's sort of like, imagine this, like if you want to learn to play tennis, if you can, one way to do it is just sit down and watch someone playing tennis for a long time. Can you learn it? No. Probably what's better is you start playing a little bit and then you, you get somebody like an expert to come by and say, no, you actually need to correct that backstroke. You know, this is how you should move your elbow. So this is just the idea behind Dagger, which has been very successful. Uh, the challenge of Dagger is that it actually requires the human, it's very tedious, because the human has to go in and tell the robot, no, you did that wrong, here's how to fix it. And you have to do these corrections or these labels. So, um, and there's a number of other, other challenges with it. Um, so we, we, we did a project last year called SHIV, which was, um, which is, SHIV is a, is a sort of uh, a more efficient form of Dagger, a smaller form of Dagger. Um, <laughs> and it, <laughs> it's a real hackronym here to make that work, but, um, <laughs> The idea is that uh, what we do is we only ask the humans for input when the state is uncertain, is risky. And rather than asking for a lot of things that are, that are fairly clear, to, that we know already, we ask you only ask, um, uh, in, uh, provide, we basically assign a cost to those labels and then only ask the humans when we really need to know. And so this has worked really nicely. These are results in these three um, scenarios. And this one is a real physical system where we're trying to, find, to reach in and grasp this um, yellow object amid clutter. So uh, the robot sort of learns to do this remarkably well uh, just by having humans demonstrate. And then when the robot starts to do it, and then the humans are correcting the robot. And then over time, we get up to about 90% success. So we can give it different configurations. Uh, it doesn't always work, but it will often um, work. And as you can see from these learning curves, it works faster. So you meet, need a lot less queries uh, to the human uh, using the SHIV, uh, SHIV algorithm. The, um, the, the, uh, this idea of so, but then um, Michael went back and he said, but this, this, the, the problem still is that you have this idea of um, covariate shift. So you, you start to observe things in an environment where the robot, you're always working inside the robot's policy, and you may not see cases that are very uh, borderline. So in, in, in you, you start to get this thing called covariate shift. And that's where the thing you're training on is not the same as what you, you might experience in practice. So you can have very dramatic failure modes. Now, this was inspired somewhat by a result from the NVIDIA in the driving context. And they got a very, very stable or very reliable um, uh, uh, steering policy by basically having cameras that weren't only the camera you would expect, like from the driver's eye view, but also cameras from the side. It showed you that what it would be like if you started drifting off the road. And they were collecting all, lots and lots of examples of those and then that was being trained in the system, so it was actually able to stabilize and help this, help this uh, overall network be trained so that it would perform well, even in those borderline conditions. So this is a new paper that's still under review, but he's been able to show that it, it, there are ways to actually achieve, uh, to formalize this by injecting noise into the, uh, into the command signal. So we actually imagine that the human is giving direction, but you're actually injecting noise, and the human is correcting it. So you're kind of a, you're basically approximating real-world conditions when things don't always go nice and smoothly, and you're you're moving a little bit out of the uh, out of the out of the, the, the probability distribution that you would normally experience. And so you can actually schedule that. You can optimize the the noise injection so that you um, you can you can have the eight, the, the noise in decrease over time as the as the policy converges. So we're getting some nice results here, comparing it to Dagger that show that this is actually gives us better performance than if we than in the uh, in the prior methods. All right. So the remaining time I want to talk about uh, it, applications have to do with uh, surgery, which is one that we've been working on for several years. Anna Mesh has played a key role in this, and um, the idea here is also to learn from demonstrations. And the nice thing about uh, surgery is that if, thanks to the Da Vinci system and intuitive, you, you actually have 
a really rich data source. You have um, the, the video images of what you're seeing, but you also have the kinematic traces because you're doing teleoperation. And um, so look at a task like this. This is, a, this is um, surgical cir circle cutting. And this is actually a training task. And actually, this is a resident trying to do this. Uh, it's a hard task with, the, with, this, uh, with, with these, um, these devices. Um, you're trying to pull the object, you're trying to pull the gauze and cut along, they're supposed to cut right along that, that, that black line, okay? It's not, not exactly perfect. Uh, so we, we wanted to try and see if we could replicate this. And what we did was we built a finite state machine by um, observing a lot of examples. So we watched what people were doing and then we, we manually constructed a finite state machine that would actually repeat this. And actually we got fairly nice um, uh, performance. So the, um, although the success rate is about 80% of being able to fully cut this uh, circle out. Um, the precision is pretty good because um, it actually is able to track the, 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 uh, the error, um, the symmetric difference of the error. You can see it's pretty close to where the, uh, the black line is. So you get fairly nice performance. But it doesn't always work. So you get failure mode. So the, the, um, uh, the system now here is just cutting in thin air. It doesn't know, um, essentially, as the, as the state is different than what it expects. It's not ab always able to correct. So we're not quite ready to perform this on, uh, on human <laughs> subjects yet. <laughs> um, but we're starting to think about how, do we, how can we learn such tasks uh, in a principled way. And the key issue here is something like that or something like um, suturing, which is, is Animesh did um, last year, is how, uh, how that we have delayed rewards. These tasks are fairly long and complex, so it's not just to just put this um, cap on a bottle, but how do you actually now do something that has uh, a number of different subtasks associated with it? And um, we, we, again, can look at demonstrations, but these are actual demonstrations from a real surgeon um, doing that circle cutting. And uh, you can see that it's pretty noisy. I mean, they're, they're not consistent, and it's just a big hairball. And so how are you going to infer what is the uh, underlying structure? If you just try to learn end to end, that whole as treated as one big policy, it's very, very difficult. You probably may be able to do it, but you'll need a lot, lot, lot of examples. And also, how do we generalize? Because if we see it trained on cutting a circle, then how about if we have something that's not quite a circle? How, how, is it gonna, how do we get a system that will generalize to that? So we've been working on uh, another acronym um, called uh, SWIRL. Uh, this is, uh, this is, the idea is to break up the task into segments and use this in a principal, principled way so that what we want to do is look at a task and then break it up into, into these uh, meaningful segments and then be able to learn each of the segments locally. And so the components here is that this, a segment is defined by a, li a locally linear model. So we have a linear model of the dynamics and what we do is we, we, we basically say that we're, we're looking for when is the transition when that model doesn't fit very well anymore. And then when we see that consistently, we consider that a transition point in the, the examples we've seen. And then we cluster the transition points into, into Gaussian, a mixed Gaussian distribution. So, and then what we want to do is come up with rewards that are consistent with each of the segments. And to do that, we use maximum entropy inverse reinforcement learning. So we're trying to basically fit a, a, a reward model to the demonstrations that we've seen just within that segment. And then, the last part is, once we have that reward model, we're going to apply Q-learning over using that reward model to learn a policy for each of the segments. And then we stitch them all together. So, um, it actually, this has been very interesting, and it, it seems to also have some capability to generalize. So once we're able to learn a model for one particular um, uh, shape, then we can, uh, that those segments actually help us to start to, we can apply those segments to other shapes. We also applied this in a number of other scenarios. So we've been looking at classic reinforcement learning benchmarks like parallel parking and things like that. And we're comparing it against other methods that are out there. And SWIRL seems to perform relatively well. I mean, where we have uh, in parallel parking, it performs n n faster. In other words, the, uh, the success rate, the probability of parking converges faster, or not converges, but at least improves faster than, uh, than the other methods. But also when we have partial observation. So we, in this case, we give up velocity, we don't know the velocity, and we can still learn um, much better than other methods really deteriorate badly. And then transfer is where we start to look at cases where the, the environments change from what we've learned on. And as we increasingly change the environment, um, the, uh, the system still performs relatively well. All right, wait, let me skip over this guy. Uh, so we, we have um, also in these cutting examples, we have ex 
that. We've done experiments with other with um, um, <coughs> other methods, and we show that the, the swirl is still performing nicely. Uh, we've also been learning another aspect, which is called tissue tensioning. So we found out that another aspect is that surgeons are really good at is if you want to cut, you need to pull, grasp the tissue somewhere and pull it um, as you're cutting. And uh, the obvious thing I, I you know you might think is just always pull orthogonal to the direction you're cutting. But it turns out that actually doesn't perform um, as well and uh, doesn't consistently perform well. So what we did was we used a, uh, a finite element model of cutting. This is just a really simplified version of a, a spring damper model of, um, of cutting. And then we use that to train a, uh, a reinforcement learning model. Um, so we're, this again is transfer because we're doing this in this uh, simulated environment, trying to learn uh, tensioning policy. So it's, you're going to pinch the part there's going to be a, a grasp point and then a tensioning policy. You're going to change the uh, pulling direction as you cut. And uh, we were able to learn that. So this is what you're seeing here is that the, we're grasping the, the object, is the pinching it at this point, and then pulling it in different directions as you're cutting. Again, this is what it's showing here is the policy that it had learned, and here's how it performs in practice. And using symmetric difference, we were able to show that that actually performs much better uh, than, than other policies we considered. Last thing I want to mention is something called DDO that we're very excited about. Um, this is under review right now, so it's, it's really new. Um, it's an idea of discovery of, of what's called deep options. And um, so we've seen all the success with, uh, with learning of, um, of, of, of complex policies in, uh, with, with deep learning. And uh, what, what one thing that seems to continuously be a challenge is, is the long horizon time. So if it's, it's one thing in games like Pong where it's a fairly clear what to do. But if you have a com more complex game, suddenly things get more challenging because you have to, like in Sequest, you have actually, th to, to be able to succeed at that, you actually have to do multiple things. You have to go down and get those, uh, those, those creatures, and then you also have to come up for air. So you're kind of doing multiple things at the same time. And if you look at something like this uh, uh, surgical task, you're tying knots, but then you're tying multiple knots within one knot, and then you're also tying uh, multiple knots along the, uh, along the, 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 uh, the cylinder. So this is really like a lot of tasks have what you might call a self-similarity. So there's structure within structure of the task. And uh, this, is, this is very true for vision, right? So um, in vision, the, 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 the features have a, a structure to them. There's a hierarchy. So you have low-level features like edges and then in corners, and then you start to put those together into eyes, and then you put eyes together into faces, eyes and noses together into faces. So, and this is also, by the way, is how we think about um, computer programs. So we, uh, computer programs have a, have a hierarchical structure as well. We think of subroutines that we reuse, and then we combine multiple subroutines together into another subroutine, and we reuse that in different places. And that gives a lot of benefits. So in, a, in, in grasping, we might see, uh, or in robotics, we might see something similar where we have um, a pick and place operation, but then the pick operation has a push and a grasp component, then there's a move, and then there's a push and a drop component in the place uh, part. But these push can be reused. So how do we do this? So in, um, there's a, there's a uh, terminology uh, in machine learning called options, which I've just learned about, where an option is basically like a, a, set a meta action um, or, or uh, a, a subroutine. And what it is is a set of, um, of, of a sequence of, of, of actions that get performed along with the termination condition. And this has actually been around for, for <coughs> almost 20 years. Uh, but the question is, how do we discover deep options um, in, a, in a neural network setting. And the, the benefits here are that you can get, um, you can get efficient training um, and over this and, the, and, and perhaps be general, generalized to, to new environments because you've essentially learned subroutines that could be applied in different cases. So here's how this works is that we, we're going to do learning not end to end, but we're going to start out by just getting just the standard way of doing uh, reinforcement learning. We're just going to um, basically train actions by looking at a lot of action, uh, state action pairs. Then we'll try and infer uh, a policy. Then we roll out that policy, and we use that to now infer, we want to infer options, which are these meta actions, and then apply those over time using both the actions and the options we've learned. So um, if you think about this as in the context of imitation learning, right? what you're doing in classic imitation learning is you're fitting a generative model, basically a policy, this pi of theta, to the observations. So you have a, you have a sequence of state action pairs. So really what we're doing in this case in DDO is, is analogous. We're in this case, we're fitting a slightly more complicated generative model to the demonstrations. And in this case, we're also going to index here where we're going to pull out which, 
which option we're going to take, and also the termination condition. So again, we're trying to infer from lots of examples what are the which policy are using and what uh, what, what termination condi conditions are consistent with that. And we can use basically policy gradient on log likelihood to do this exactly as we do with uh, the, the initial form of uh, reinforcement learning. And um, and so the advantages we believe, and again, this is really early, but the benefits we think are that we you, you get a more compact representation because you're now combining sequences of actions together. Uh, you get uh, divide and conquer, so you can take a, a task that has a long horizon time. You're breaking it up into these components so that you can quickly execute this little encapsulated subroutine to uh, perform this aspect of it rather than having to, to learn each individual uh, state action step. Um, you can reuse and transfer. This is, um, uh, can we start using uh, these options in other contexts? Explainability is one I'm really excited about because uh, this is a big uh, black hole in, uh, in, 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 in deep learning right now, which is you get this system, it may work, but you don't know why. But maybe with options, when we start to look at their structure, we can zero in and start to understand what is really, what, what's it doing? So for example, in the Atari game, you can see some pattern where it's, where it's repeating the same thing over again, and we can drill down and start to see what, the, um, what, what, it's, what it's solving there. And then focus training, which is where you can go back and you can say now with that subroutine, if it seems to be useful, that option, you can now give it examples more and more just around that option and fine tune and hone that the performance on that option so that we'll get better, each of those options will get better. And then the big goal again is, uh, is, is transfer. So if we can do this, we can we start to generalize and transfer to new tasks that we haven't trained on. Okay, so uh, this is what we covered a lot in uh, 50 minutes here. We talked about cloud robotics grasping these first, the first, second, and third wave that combines the, the first two. And then I gave you some uh, quick, quick, uh, probably too quick uh, overview of what we've been doing in, in, in inverse, uh, sorry, in uh, inverse learning and, um, uh, uh, and reinforcement learning. Um, and invitation learning and reinforcement learning. I want to quickly thank our sponsors and, uh, and also mention, because we're here for Toyota, that uh, we're now working with uh, Toyota's uh, HSR robot. And I'm very excited about, um, about this new, uh, new baby in our lab that we just got about uh, two weeks ago. Okay, thank you. So I'm happy to take questions if we have time. I know it's about 12 now, so people have to go. One. It's one. Oh, it's one. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's take a couple of questions. Yes. So, like in the dev, uh, dev stack uh, papers, like it seems like you are using the analytic approach to get labels for the to train empirical uh, approaches. As does like it, se it seems that like the analytic approaches become the like upper limit of the like things you can train, and so like when the but so w w prob like so for more complex tasks, when this like the physics models or three D shapes are like a little noisy or harder to get, or when the simulation is not so accurate, like are like how can we guarantee like it can still tr learn like useful things that can be uh, like used in like, real world. Well, it's a little bit really. If you could, if you could summarize the question. Oh, okay. Well, when um, we're using analytic models with a number of, of assumptions that are built in, and so as Silvio mentioned, right, what happens in real world where, um, for example, there's there's the things are very low friction, right? There's something um, slip. Things are slippery or deformable, right? Which is very very common. And the question is that those analytic models we know are not going to work there, right? They weren't made to. They're, they're, that's vi that grossly violates their assumptions. So the answer is that, that it, it, what we can try and do, and by the way, there are analytic models for deformable and slippery objects, but they're very, very hard to work with. Uh, but you could conceivably try to incorporate those and then train a system that would be, um, again, generate examples for that and then see if that would train a neural net um, or a deep network. But one of the things that uh, we're, we're, we've been just curious about was why it does seem to be working even in those kind of conditions with the model that was trained on uh, rigid, with rigid assumptions. So to answer your question, I guess I think we want to be careful here. I, I certainly, I, I want to say, I, I, I think it's really important for all of us working in this field to be uh, circumspect about claims. It's really easy to get caught up. And if you start reading you know, the newspaper or watching uh, you know, science fiction, you quickly, you know, it's, it, it, as though this is all around the corner, all these problems are going to be solved. And I think it's up to us who are really working on the front lines and trying to basically say, hey, wait a second, this, there's a lot of 
uh, failure modes here. This doesn't always work. And uh, so your, to your question, I think that's a, it's a great point. We are making that fundamental assumption so far. We're seeing a little bit of evidence that it seems to generalize a little bit outside to some of these deformable surfaces. But by no means do I want to claim that, I, that that's ready to handle any kind of deformable surface. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. One more question? Yes. What do you mean by derivative for your presentation? What do you want to mean by? Oh, um, it's based on sampling. So what you're doing is you're sampling the, um, uh, we're, we're basically just sampling the space. We're not actually taking derivatives because you can't take derivatives in this uh, high dimensional space. And it's not a, it's not a, a, a clean method. I mean, not, it's not a, uh, an analytic model. So you're just basically taking samples, you're basically um, exploring. So you're just taking perturbations or possible steps, looking at all the, um, the outputs there. And this is a gradient method, but without an, without an analytic model. All right, let's thank Ken for a great talk. Thank you.